Hare Krishna. So welcome everyone to today's class. Uh, we're going to talk about Lord Chaitanya's initiation and Sankirtan pastimes. So yeah, yesterday we heard about his appearance, his birth, his um, growing up in Navadweep, his childhood pastimes, his marriage. And so now uh, we're going to see a big, uh, we're going to see a big change in Nimai. <laughs> so I think we were talking yesterday about how the Vaishnavas in Navadvip would were actually like a little frustrated with Nimai. Were we talking about that? How like he was this arrogant scholar and he was just going around debating with everyone. And did we talk about that? How they wanted him to be a devotee or no? Maybe that's today's class. See. Oh yeah, sorry. That's what we're going to do today. <laughs> Everything's all muddled up in my mind. Okay, so Lord Chaitanya's initiation. We see that even Krishna, you know, goes to school. He accepts a teacher, Sandipani Muni, and so Lord Chaitanya he comes in the form of a devotee to show us how to be devotees of Krishna. Show us how to follow the process of bhakti. And so Lord Chaitanya also will accept diksha or initiation from a spiritual master. And the first time that he meets his spiritual master is in Navadvip. So Ishvara, his, his spiritual master's name is Ishvara Puri. And Ishvara Puri is a pure devotee. He's a disciple of Madhavendra Puri, who is also a pure devotee. Uh, so the, both of them are Mahabhagavats and they come in disciplic succession in the Brahma, Madhva, Sampradaya. And uh, Madhavendra Puri particularly, he was known to be just like a treasure house of pure ecstatic love for Krishna. Um, Ishvara Puri was his disciple and he was also a sannyasi. So Ishvara Puri would travel a lot and wherever he would go, just like you know, sanya, devotee sannyasis do, they try to share Krishna consciousness. So one time when Ishvara Puri was traveling, then he came to Navadvi. And this was where he met. Anyways, uh, Ishvara Puri came to Navadvi and he met Nimai. So Nimai, as is the custom in greeting a sannyasi, he paid obeisances. And then as soon as Ishvara Puri saw Nimai's beautiful, transcendental form and his, his features of his face and just everything, he could understand that this was an exalted personality. This was not an ordinary personality that he was dealing with. So he asked, you know, he said, oh, um, what's your name? And, and, he, and Nimai was always, at that time, he was always surrounded by students because he was such a famous teacher. He always had like a whole crew of students going around with him, like his followers. And so his students said, uh, this is Nimai Pandit, like the <laughs> famous Nimai Pandit. So Ishvara Puri had actually heard of Nimai because he was a famous scholar. Uh, and so he was, you know, happy to be meeting the famous Nimai Pandit. But he didn't recognize him to be the Lord, but he did feel a special affection for Nimai. And Nimai also was quite entranced by this meeting because unlike Ishvara Puri, he did recognize Ishvara Puri as his eternal servant who performs the service of being his spiritual master. So he knew straight away, he knew this is the person who is my spiritual master, my eternal spiritual master. But he didn't say anything. Uh, what he did do was he invited Ishvara Puri over to his house for lunch and uh, Mother Sachi cooked for everyone and then after lunch, they were, um, you know, relaxing and just talking, speaking Krishna Kata, because that was what Ishvara Puri spoke about, even though Lord Chaitanya in those times was still, you know, not openly being a devotee in the full sense of the word. Uh, but Lord Chaitanya observed that when, when Ishvara Puri spoke about Krishna, then he became overwhelmed with ecstatic love. And he was exhibiting all these like ecstatic symptoms in his body, like tears in the eyes and shivering in his body. And so he's, he could understand this. Ishvara Puri is like really, 
a real, like a true blue devotee, very advanced devotee. So Lord Chaitanya would go visit Ishvara Puri while he was staying in Navadip. He would go um, regularly to see him. And it, it so happened that Ishvara Puri was working on a book at the time. And his book was about Krishna. It was describing the transcendental qualities of Krishna. And since he knew that Nimai was a scholar and then he was a specifically expert you know, in grammar, in Sanskrit grammar, and because Ishvapur was writing in Sanskrit language, then he asked Nimai to edit his book. He thought Nimai is a younger person and you know, he's a, he's a Grihasta and he's a teacher. So I'm a sannyasi. It's appropriate that he, you know, I can ask him to do some service for me. <laughs> so he, he engaged Nimai in his service. And uh, this was really nice because every day the, the two of them would get together for a couple of hours and just go through the book and see what, what's written there. And, and because the book was about Krishna's qualities, then they would be discussing and enjoying Krishna Kata in each other's company for a couple of hours every day. But still, at least externally, it appeared that Nimai was more interested in his you know scholarly debates than he was in devotional service and uh, it's hard to understand it's really hard to understand this this uh, sort of episode or this phase in Lord Chaitanya's life where he's not where he, he came to show how to be a devotee and when he was a child you know he would engage everyone chanting Hare Krishna but he just went through this phase in his youth you know like a lot of youth go through <laughs> where he just wasn't really interested in devotional service and uh, he was just doing his own thing, just, you know, creating his own, uh, you know, re reputation and, and uh, getting followers and studying and teaching and, yeah, just pursuing his career, I guess you could say, in almost a mundane sense. So, yeah, during that time, Nimai, he was, he, he was actually very arrogant, you know, because he was so proud because he knew no one could defeat him in a philosophical debate. He was just totally undefeatable because he was the Lord. Uh, and But what he would do is he would go around and just approach. He would basically like accost people in the street, especially the Vaishnavas, and challenge them in some kind of philosophical challenge. And then he would debate with them. And they would be trying to argue on the basis of, you know, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, some, you know, point of bhakti, of, you know, like the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. And Lord Chaitanya would just smash them. He would just defeat them. And it was so uh, disturbing to the devotees to have to deal with that. It was just like, you know, let's say like every time you go out to Krishna lunch and then you have to meet some, you know, born again Christian who's just trying to tear you apart and dismantle your beliefs and challenge your faith. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just like, it's even if you're, they don't shake your faith, but it, it's just, draining <laughs> yeah so it got to the point that actually like if the Vaishnavas if the devotees like Advaita Charya, Shivas Thakur, Haridas Thakur if they would see Lord Chaitanya coming uh, approaching them they would cross the side to the other side of the street <laughs> or they would just run away to avoid a confrontation with him uh, so but still they appreciated that Lord Chaitanya is so intelligent and he's so influential that um, he, they could appreciate that he was a special personality. And they thought that if Nimai would just become a devotee, wouldn't that be wonderful? Like he could convince so many people to be devotees with his genius brain, with his charm, with his beauty, with his attractive features, with his attractive personality, like he would just be the best preacher ever. <laughs> uh, so then uh, I'm going to read a little bit here from Chaitanya Bhagavat. Uh, this is from Adi Lila, chapter 12, starting from text 32, uh, where the devotees are discussing amongst themselves about this very topic. So the scene is that Nimai Pandit's sitting on the bank of the Ganga, and he's surrounded by students, and uh, they're asking him questions. He's explaining the scriptures to them in terms of grammar and logic and, you know, philosophy and preparing them, you know, with like rhetoric and debate techniques and things like that to you know be good philosophers uh, without much emphasis on bhakti and then in the distance uh, the devotees are there too because in the evening that the Vaishnavas had this um, routine of kind of meeting on the banks of the Ganga around sunset and just talking about Krishna Kata maybe doing a little kirtan chanting the Gayatri's as the sun goes down 
So they would get together like that. So uh, it says that they were, they were listening. So though they were a little bit far away, they were listening to Nimai's explanations and they were feeling uh, mixed feelings. So uh, they were happy that Nimai is such an uh, extraordinary personality, but they were lamenting at the same time that he is not a devotee. So they have this conversation. But one of them says, uh, if anyone possesses such beauty and knowledge, yet doesn't worship Krishna, then there's no benefit in their beauty and knowledge. It's all just a waste of time. You know, like even the Bhagavatam says, it's just decorations on a dead body, basically. What is the value of that if it doesn't advance you in your bhakti? And then another person said, yeah, you're right. Uh, and I've seen, too, that anyone who sees him just runs away in fear of facing his challenge. And someone else says, when he sees someone, he doesn't allow the person to leave. He captures him just like a tax collector captures a debtor. And then someone says, you know, this Brahmin, though, he has uncommon potency. I think he must be some great personality. We've never seen such knowledge in an ordinary person. And our only regret is that he doesn't worship Krishna. So then all the Vaishnavas requested each other. So all the Vaishnavas sitting together, they're having this discussion. And then they all say, look, let's all together, combinedly, bless Nimai so that his mind will become fixed on Krishna. So they all offer their obeisances there to the Lord on the bank of the Ganges, and they bless Nimai with this prayer. Oh, Krishna, please let the son of Jagannath Mishra become absorbed in you without deviation. <laughs> so they're all praying for Nimai. Please let him become Krishna conscious. I just find it so funny that, you know, like, who can understand the Lord's transcendental pastimes? So... Um, yeah, but then there are other descriptions at this same time period that even though he was acting that way externally, Lord Chaitanya was uh, simultaneously internally absorbed in ecstatic love for Krishna. And usually it wouldn't show, but on rare occasions it would manifest and he would, you know, have symptoms. And, uh, but because of his external uh, demonstrations or his external characteristics, Nobody guessed that there were symptoms of ecstatic love, and they just thought it was some kind of illness. You know, they would take him to the doctor and get him checked out. They thought it was some kind of gastric disorder or something. So, uh, so that was going on. And then, like we were saying, before the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, the situation in Navadvip was really bad. You know, people were just totally absorbed in materialistic af affairs trying to enjoy themselves either through sinful activities or through materialistic pious rituals, worshiping demigods. And even though Lord Chaitanya now had appeared and he was already grown up, you know, he'd already like passed through his whole childhood and youth and was married. Now he's on his second marriage already. And he still hasn't started the Sankirtan movement. So the situation in the world is, is more or less the same, that there's a, there's a handful of devotees, but the whole rest of the world is absorbed in sense gratification. And even those few devotees, um, they when they would do kirtan, it was usually just amongst themselves. They weren't trying to pull other people in. They weren't doing outreach. They weren't going out on Harinam on the street and things. It was just kind of like their little private practice. And yet the residents of Navadri, because many of them were atheists or demigod worshipers, they couldn't tolerate the activities of the Vaishnavas. And they were always blaspheming them and harassing them. And it got to be super antagonistic. Uh, at one point, they were even talking about smashing the devotees' houses and driving them out of town. So it was very unfavorable. And Lord Chaitanya, um, of course, internally, you know, he's the Lord. And so, you know, his devotees are always dear to him. So seeing the devotees in distress, then uh, Nimai finally decided that it was time to manifest himself and begin the Sankirtan movement. So then he had to go and find his spiritual master. And uh, on the plea of um, performing the Shraddha ceremony, because Jagannath Mishra had passed away already, uh, Nimai went to a, the holy place called Gaya, where Ishvara Puri lived. So he traveled there. He got his uh, mother's permission because he was going on behalf of his father to do this ceremony. So she said, yes, go with my blessings. 
And uh, the first thing Lord Chaitanya did when he got to Gaya was he went to a temple, a big temple of Lord Vishnu that they have there and took darshan. So because now he's already decided that I'm going to manifest myself, I'm going to start Sankirtan. So now looking at the, taking that darshan of Lord Vishnu and just gazing at the lotus feet of the Lord, his heart melted and tears of love uh, you know, he let those signs show the tears of love flowing from his eyes. And then at that moment, by the arrangement of providence, which of course is the arrangement of the Lord, Ishvara Puri entered the temple also for uh, Darshan. And then Nimai saw him and he was so happy. He paid obeisances. Ishvara Puri was similarly super ecstatic to see Nimai again. And they embraced each other and they were just really um, ecstatic. So Nimai had already made up his mind that he was going to take initiation from Ishvara Puri. And he very straightforwardly kind of brought that to Ishvara Puri's attention. And he told Ishvara Puri, my journey to Gaia has become successful now that I have seen your lotus feet. Your lotus feet are even holier than the holy places themselves because your presence purifies those holy places like we were hearing about the Ganga, right? That the devotees bathe in the Ganga and purify the, the Ganga of sinful activities of non-devotees that bathe there. So uh, Lord Chaitanya said, please deliver me from the ocean of material existence. I surrender myself to you. I beg that you make me drink the nectar of Krishna's lotus feet. And Ishvara Puri responded also with a lot of affection for the Lord saying, since I saw you in Navadvi, I felt great ecstasy. In fact, I'm unable to think about anything else. I have no attraction to anything or anyone but you. And when I see you, I feel like I'm seeing Krishna. So they were both, uh, you know, really opening up their hearts to each other in such a loving, devotional, mutually appreciative way. And Nimai, he didn't acknowledge the, the statement at all that when I see you, I feel like I'm seeing Krishna. He just said, that is my good fortune. He just took a humble position that if you remember Krishna, then that's my good fortune that I'm able to somehow remind you of Krishna. So then that meeting took place. And after that, Nimai went and he performed the Shraddha ceremony for his father. And then in the evening, he went home to the room. He was staying in a, a room in a guest house. Uh, and he started cooking a meal for himself. And just when he was finishing the cooking, then Ishvara Puri arrived, knocked on his door. And uh, of course, Lord Chaitanya welcomed him in. And then Ishvara Puri said jokingly, oh, Pandit, I see I've come at the right time. <laughs> in other words, Prasadam was just ready. <laughs> Good timing. So then there's this very sweet uh, conversation that takes place in the Chaitanya Bhagavat that I want to, I'll just read here. It, it's, a, it's In one way, it's, it's sort of a detail. It's not like a significant thing but I felt like it's just very sweet about the relationship between Lord Chaitanya and his spiritual master even though Lord Chaitanya is the Lord but his relationship with Ishvara Puri is, is just very sweet and endearing so uh, Ishvara Puri says this yeah hey I came I showed up at the right time Nimai said yes it will be my good my good fortune if you can take your meal here today then Ishvara Puri, Ishvara Puri said but uh, you know, you cooked for yourself. If I eat it, then what will you eat? Nimai said, no problem. I'll just cook again. Then Ishvara Puri says, no, you don't need to cook again. Just whatever is here, you divide in half and we'll share. <laughs> half, half. Nimai said, he said, uh, well, if you really want to please me, then please eat whatever I've cooked. So then uh, Ishvara Puri, wanting to please the Lord, said, okay, if it makes you happy that I just eat then i'll eat and so then uh, lord chaitanya happily served ishvara puri prasadam with his own hands and uh, ishvara puri was eating with great relish with great ecstasy and lord chaitanya served him really nicely with devotion and then when he finished eating then um, lord chaitanya also just encouraged him to relax and he took uh, he ground up sandalwood paste and he smeared it on Ishvara Puri's body. And yeah, Lord Chaitanya was just really in a mood of deep devotion and love for his guru. So then the next day, 
because that place Gaya is also the place where Ishvapur was born, his birthplace. So Ishvapur, um, Lord Chaitanya went to the exact site of birth of Ishvapur and he got dust from the ground there. And uh, he was really happy to have that. And he collected some dust and he kept it in a clean cloth and he tied it safely like that and kept it like a, you know, something. His, the greatest treasure in his life was that dust from the birthplace of his guru. And then a few days later, he approached Ishwara Puri and specifically asked him for initiation. So Ishwara Puri very humbly replied, uh, what to speak of giving you initiation? I can give my life to you. <laughs> so Ishwara Puri then initiated him and he gave him Diksha. In those days, they didn't do like first and second initiation, but Diksha meant that that was everything. That was all like one initiation in which you got the, um, you know, Gayatri Mantra. So Ishwara Puri gave him the Gopal Gayatri Mantra. And uh, yeah, so uh, after that, Lord Chaitanya, he like, through this pastime, we see that Initiation is a very important uh, practice. is important. It's an important step in spiritual life. Uh, that it's the beginning. You know, Prabhupada said initiation is the beginning. It's actually the beginning of your spiritual life. And Lord Chaitanya showed because it was only after his initiation that he started to really act like a devotee and and uh, begin the Sankirtan movement, which is what he came for. So in Chaitanya Charitamrita, we also have some little insight into the instructions that Ishvara Puri gave Lord Chaitanya at the time of his initiation. And this is, Lord Chaitanya speaks this himself. Uh, he's speaking to the leader of the Mayavadi sannyasis named Prakashananda Saraswati, who challenges him in, in a criticizing way, saying, you know, how is it that you're just chanting and dancing like a madman and, you know, you don't study the scriptures anymore and you're supposed to be a sannyasi, why don't you study Vedanta? So Lord Chaitanya tells him that um, my spiritual master considered me a fool and therefore he chastised me. You are a fool, he said. You are not qualified to study Vedanta philosophy and therefore you must always chant the holy name of Krishna. This is the essence of all mantras or Vedic hymns. Simply by chanting the holy name of Krishna, one can obtain freedom from material existence. Indeed, simply by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, one will be able to see the lotus feet of the Lord. In this age of Kali, there is no religious principle other than the chanting of the holy name, which is the essence of all Vedic hymns. This is the purport of all scriptures. After describing, oh yeah, so this, this is the instructions that he gave him about, you know, just forget about studies, because what's the point of studying the Vedas when the essence of all the Vedas is to chant Hare Krishna. So just chant this Maha Mantra and don't worry about it. And the fact that he called Lord Chaitanya a fool when, you know, he knew he was Nimai Pandit. He knew his fame all over, you know, the probably most of India. And uh, he was famous as a scholar. And he's saying, you're not qualified to study Vedanta philosophy. So if Lord Chaitanya wasn't qualified to study, Nimai Pandit wasn't qualified to study Vedanta philosophy, then what to speak of the rest of us, you know? <laughs> we just have to chant Hare Krishna and uh, read the books that are written by the followers of Lord Chaitanya, which are based on his teachings as our primary texts, like Nectar of Instruction, Nectar of Devotion, Chaitanya Charitamrita, like that. And also the books that Lord Chaitanya studied, like Brahma Samhita, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, that Lord Chaitanya said that Srimad Bhagavatam is the... the um, this highest authority of all scriptures. So that's what we do, following in the footsteps of Lord Chaitanya. And so now this uh, continues here from uh, Lord Chaitanya speaking to Prakashananda Saraswati about his guru's instructions to him. Lord Chaitanya says, after describing the potency of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, my spiritual master taught me another verse advising me to always keep it within my throat. So this verse is a verse that we all know. 
Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nastyeva, 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 Gatiranyata. For spiritual progress in this age of Kali, there is no alternative. There is no alternative. There is no alternative to the holy name, the holy name, the holy name of the Lord. So these were the instructions that Lord Chaitanya got and Lord Chaitanya followed them. He was a perfect disciple. He didn't argue, well, wait a minute, I'm a pundit, I'm a teacher, and now what? Everyone's going to think that I'm, you know, uh, that I am useless now, and what about my career, and what about my students? And <laughs> he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't present any whatabouts at all. He just immediately accepted. And he continues, he says this, he says, uh, since I received this order from my spiritual master, I always chant the holy name. But I thought that by chanting and chanting the holy name, I had been bewildered. So even now, see, he took, he took the order of his spiritual master with full faith. But then the effects of the chanting were not what he expected. Because he was expecting that by chanting, he would, you know, everything would become clear. And all the knowledge of the Vedas would become manifest in his heart. And, you know, his path would become illuminated and he would be enlightened but what he experienced uh, is that he felt like he was becoming bewildered he says while chanting the holy name of the lord in pure ecstasy i lose myself and thus i laugh cry dance and sing just like a madman uh, collecting my patience therefore i began to consider that chanting the holy name of krishna had covered my spiritual knowledge so he was thinking that actually this chanting of Hare Krishna was making him go a little crazy and he was really like losing a grip <laughs> on reality and even on the spiritual knowledge that he had. So he was worried. He said, I saw that I had become mad by chanting the holy name and I immediately submitted this at the lotus feet of my spiritual master. So this is a good practice, you know, if something that you're doing in your devotional service you're, becomes concerning <laughs> to you or others, then go to your spiritual master and be like, I'm trying to follow this instruction you gave me, but I'm having some problems with it. I'm not sure if it's helping or harming me. Please um, give me some guidance. So that's exactly what he did. He, he went to Ishwar Puri. He said, my dear Lord, my dear Guru, what kind of mantra have you given me? I've, I've become mad simply by chanting this Maha Mantra. Chanting the holy name in ecstasy causes me to dance, laugh, and cry. And then he, he, he narrates, when my spiritual master heard all this, he smiled and then began to speak. It is the nature of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra that anyone who chants it immediately develops his loving ecstasy for Krishna. Religiosity, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation are known as the four goals of life. But before love of Godhead, the fifth and highest goal, these appear as insignificant as straw in the street. For a devotee who has actually developed bhava, the pleasure derived from dharma, artha, kama, and moksha appear like drops in the presence of the sea. It is a characteristic of love of God that by nature it induces transcendental symptoms in one's body and wake, makes one more and more greedy to achieve the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. When one actually develops love of Godhead, he naturally sometimes cries, laughs, chants, and sometimes runs here and there just like a madman. Perspiration, trembling, standing on end of one's bodily hairs, tears, faltering voice, fading complexion, madness, melancholy, patience, pride, joy, and humility. These are various natural symptoms of ecstatic love of God, which cause a devotee to dance and float in an ocean of transcendental bliss while chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. It is very good, my dear child, that you have attained the supreme goal of life by developing this love of Godhead. Thus, you have pleased me very much, and I am very much obliged with you. My dear child, continue dancing, chanting, and performing Sankirtan in association with devotees. Furthermore, go out and preach the value of chanting Krishna Nam, for by this process you will be able to deliver all souls. So now he got another instruction. <laughs> he got that one confirmed that you're doing very well. This, your chanting's going very well. Now go out and give this to others. So Lord Chaitanya started doing just that. So from then on, Lord Chaitanya just started, you know, manifesting his loving devotional sentiments for Krishna. He went back to Navadvipa Navadvi this time, and he started just giving love of God to everyone, giving the holy name to everyone, teaching devotional service, uh, 
to everyone, starting with his own mother and then just everybody that he met. Uh, and when the when the Navadvip devotees like Advaita Charya, Srivas, Thakur, Haridas Thakur saw it, they were like ecstatic. They were like, yes, Krishna answered our prayers. Nimai has become a devotee. And they were jumping for joy, embracing each other, thinking now there's hope for the world. Then there are all of Lord Chaitanya's students. So he had thousands of students that were waiting for him to come back, you know, to continue their lessons with him. And they weren't expecting, you know, the transformation in him that happened. So they, when he came back, they were like, oh, when will we have our lessons? You'll continue teaching us now, right? Uh, and Lord Chaitanya said, okay, I can continue teaching you. But then everything that he would explain was just uh, every verse that they would read from their texts uh, Lord Chaitanya would just uh, interpret it in such a way that it was just glorifying the holy name of Krishna. And he would explain everything in such a way as to show that how every verse was just pointing to Krishna. And sometimes he would become absorbed in ecstatic uh, trance while like, doing his explanations because it was just all about Krishna and he would get like very absorbed. And uh, yeah, so his students were very fortunate. They got like you know, from the Lord himself, lessons about bhakti, holy name, seeing his ecstatic symptoms. So all of his students were delivered that way. And now Nimai wasn't arrogant anymore, but he was so humble. And it's described in the Chaitanya Bhagavat that he would uh, offer obeisances to all the Vaishnavas, and he would even do menial services for the Vaishnavas. Like personally, he would wash their clothes, hang them out to dry, um, fold them up, you know, and... Uh, like that, and he would get together with all the devotees to chat in Kirtan. So, oh my God, this class is gonna go a little over time. Okay, I'll try to speed it up. <laughs> uh, all right, so I just wanna tell you about a very special event, which was the meeting of Lord Chaitanya with Lord Nityananda for the first time. And this is described in a lot of detail in the Chaitanya Bhagavad. So Lord Nityananda, uh, he was staying in Vrindavan and he was just waiting for Lord Chaitanya to manifest his Sankirtan pastimes. He's like, there's no use me going there now with this Nimai Pandit phase, you know, like I'm not interested in that. I want to join the Sankirtan movement. So as soon as he heard that Lord Chaitanya was now starting the Sankirtan, he went there and he went uh, secretly and he hid in the house of Nandana Acharya, one of the Vaishnavas. And Lord Chaitanya, but Lord Chaitanya knew, he could sense that, um, he could sense that Lord Nityananda was in town and he told the Vaishnavas, go, there's a great personality somewhere, you need to find him. He didn't know exactly where he was, or at least he was pretending not to know. And the devotees looked all over, they couldn't find him anywhere. And uh, finally they came back to Lord Chaitanya said, we searched every house, even the houses of the meat eaters and we couldn't find anyone. And Lord Chaitanya said, okay, I'm gonna come with you and we're gonna find him. And then they went, they went to the house of Nandanacharya and they, there was Lord Nityananda and he came out. And when the two of them first met, it was like, it was just like an explosion of mutual love. <laughs> you know, it's like they just embraced each other and fainted and stood up and embraced each other again and bathed each other in tears. And uh, yeah, it was just very ecstatic. So, um, and then Lord Chaitanya wanted everyone to understand what a great personality Lord Nityananda was because Lord Nityananda, he looked a little random because he was an avidut. So Lord Chaitanya was worried that maybe the Vaishnavas wouldn't accept him. So he chanted this verse that was describing the Krishna uh, from Srimad Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam 10, 21, 5, that says, wearing a peacock feather ornament on his head, blue kanikara flowers on his ears, a yellow garment as brilliant as gold, and the Vajayanti garland, Lord Krishna exhibited his transcendental form as the greatest of dancers as he entered the forest of Vrindavan, beautifying it with the marks of his footprints. He filled the holes of his flute with the nectar of his lips, and the cowherd boys sang his glories. So as soon as Lord Nityananda heard that verse, he immediately like just fell down, and just lost his external consciousness due to ecstasy. And then Lord Chaitanya said, keep reciting. So he kept repeating that verse. And then Lord Nityananda would like 
come to his senses and then he would again become like stunned in ecstasy and start crying and then crash down to the ground and he was jumping in the air and crashing down to the ground with such like force that the devotees were like worried you know they were like praying krishna please save him please like don't let him get hurt they thought he was going to break his bones anyways it was just like a level of ecstasy that they had never perceived before and uh, and the only way that Lord Nityananda would calm down was that Lord Chaitanya just kind of like grabbed hold of him and sat down and put Lord Nityananda on his lap <laughs> and just held on to him uh, and then Lord Nityananda he was just floating in the water of love of Lord Chaitanya and from that day on the two of them uh were you know doing uh, starting sankirtan they 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 were um, chanting the holy names together all the time so yeah so that what to speak of the first turning point was lord chaitanya's initiation second turning point was when lord nityananda came that that's when the sankirtan movement just took off like wildfire and they started performing the nightly kirtans in the house of shivas Thakur. lord chaitanya would chant and lose himself in love of god they would take the kirtan out in the street and get everyone to chat. They didn't care like what the person's caste was, what their religion was, what their gender was, just like no discrimination whatsoever. Just get everyone to chat Hare Krishna. And uh, actually like the caste Brahmins at the time, they just thought that was so bogus to give the sacred names of God to the Shudras and to the untouchables and meat eaters. And so they actually went and filed a complaint to the chief magistrate of Navadweep, the Chand Kazi. Uh, and this was what they said. They said, now this is from Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, chapter 17, verse 209. This Nimai Pandit has made all the people practically ma mad by always performing congregational chanting. At night, we can't get any sleep. He keeps us awake with all the noise. Now he's even given up his own name, Nimai, and he introduces himself by the name Gora Hari. He has spoiled the Hindu religious principles and introduced the irreligion of non-believers. Now, even the lower classes are chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. For this sinful activity, the entire city of Navadweep will be deserted. According to the Hindu scriptures, God's name is the most powerful hymn. If everyone hears the chanting of the name, the potency of the hymn will be lost. So they're thinking that this Lord Chaitanya is corrupting the Hindu Dharma by giving this name out cheaply to unqualified people. It's going to become contaminated and watered down and made cheap, and it's going to lose its potency and we'll all be finished. <laughs> so, and people will, by this sinful activity, people will be getting bad reactions and nobody, the whole town will be immersed in suffering and it'll be destroyed. So, so then they go to the Kazi, they say, you are the ruler of this town. So whether Hindu or Muslim, everyone is under your protection. So you need to protect the people from this dangerous influence of Nimai Pandit. So please just call him and make him leave town. Uh, so the Chan Kazi, he took it seriously. You know, he's like, okay, these are respectable Brahmins and they're complaining about someone that they think is like a heretic basically. So I'm going to stop this Nimai Pandit from disturbing people. I'm going to stop his Harinam. <laughs> Literally says, I shall certainly prohibit Nimai Pandit from continuing his Hari Krishna movement. <laughs> so the next day, Chan Kazi, he sent his constables out to stop the Harinam. As soon as they saw the devotees out in the street chanting and playing instruments, they went and they smashed the Murdangas, the clay Murdangas, they shattered them and they beat up the devotees. And, um, it wasn't until the next day that Lord Chaitanya got the news of all that had happened. And when he did, he became like fire. He literally roared with transcendental anger. And he immediately called out for Lord Nityananda. It's like, Nityananda, go and get all the Vaishnavas, assemble everyone out in the street, get all the musical instruments, flags, torches. And we are going to do a Sankirtan party all over Navadweep. We're going to shower this town with love of God. And let's see what anyone is going to do to try to stop me. So Lord Chaitanya was <laughs> really fired up. And so everyone got together. And this was, you know, Lord Chaitanya is famous actually in history, Indian history, as uh, the leader of like a whole civil disobedience movement that revolutionized West Bengal. Um, 
So they went through Navadu, this huge kirtan. And as because it was such a fired up kirtan, then people got attracted. People were coming out of their houses and joining in because it wasn't just a kirtan. It was like a political revolutionary social movement. <laughs> it was like something that affected everyone. So by the time they got to the house of the Chandkazi, there were millions, literally like millions of people. And the Kirtan, the Harinam procession extended for miles. There were just miles of people. You couldn't see the end of it. And the chanting was so loud that the, the Kazi could hear it from one kilometer away. Uh, and the devotees were in so much bliss. They were just chanting and dancing. And in the meantime, any of the Kazi's men that saw them, that went there to try to stop it, they just ran away like in fear of their lives. So they get to the doorway, they get to the house of the Kazi, right in front of the doorstep where they're like blazing torches and kirtan like roaring, like tumultuous. And then Lord Chaitanya in a booming voice, he's like, where is that rascal Kazi? So Chan Kazi was afraid and he was hiding in the house uh, because he had a dream the night before in which Lord Chaitanya came, uh, sorry, Lord Nirsingadev came and like jumped on his chest and like sunk his claws into his chest and said um, that just like you broke the Murdunga drums, I'm going to rip apart your chest. So Kazi was like really fearful and begging for forgiveness and, you know, apologizing profusely to save his life. So Lord Nisingadev in the dream said, okay, I'm not going to kill you. I'll spare your life, but let this be a lesson. If you ever try to stop the Harinam again, I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm going to kill you, your whole family, and all the meat eaters in this town. So then, uh, so that happened the night before. Now Lord Chaitanya is out there calling for Kazi to come, and the Kazi's like so shaken up. But he goes out and then Lord Chaitanya sees him in that state and he kind of feels a little compassion for him. And he starts, he calms down. He, start, he deals with him very sweetly and diplomatically and they have a whole philosophical conversation. And by the end of it, um, the Kazi is, his heart is really like melted by Lord Chaitanya's kindness and compassion. He just wasn't expecting that. And uh, he started crying and he bent down and touched Lord Chaitanya's feet and said, only by your mercy have my bad intentions vanished. Uh, may my devotion always be fixed on you. So even though he was a Muslim, he, he um, really appreciated Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya said, okay, Kazi, then I ask one thing from you in charity. You must pledge that the Sankirtan movement will never be checked, at least within the district of Nadia in which you are ruling. And Chan Kazi said, yeah, I, I'll do it. <laughs> And then he made a pro proclamation that to as many descendants that take birth in my dynasty in the future, I give this grave admonition that no one should check the Harinam Sankirtan movement. So not him, he's him or anyone in his dynasty in the future, as long as you know, his line isn't ruling the Navadu. So the devotees are really happy. They are jumping for joy and chanting Hari Hari Bol and and they left in a victorious kirtan, and the Kazi joined them in that kirtan, and they went Kazi, chanting with the Kazi through the streets of Navadvip. So now it was like a complete free-for-all. You know, no one could stop the Sankirtan movement. So, yeah. And, yeah, from there, it just, it just spread. And we shall talk more about what happens after that on Monday. All right. <laughs> So thank you all. Are there any um, questions or comments on the, these pastimes that we talked about this evening? Hi, Krishna. I have a quick question. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for the ecstatic sharing of these pastimes. Um, maybe I missed it. I came in a little late. I'm really sorry. But I was wondering why Lord Chaitanya felt like he had to go all the way to Gaia to do the Shraddha ceremony for his father. It's a special place there. It's like known for that ceremony. I mm, think, okay. there, yeah, there's something like, I think it's a place where there's like a confluence of rivers and uh, yeah, it's a place, it's just a place that it's where everyone goes to do the Shraddha ceremony. It's known for that. Mm, but don't you have that in Navadvip as well? <laughs> 
like the confluence of the rivers. I mean, he his main reason for going was to get initiated by Ishrapur and he knew mm. where he was there. So that was just an excuse. You know, that was just like Ah, I see. I see. Yeah. On the on the plea of doing that, he actually like achieved his real mission of getting initiated. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I see something here in the chat. Nimai's initiated name. Yeah, so his name didn't actually get changed at initiation as far as I can tell. Only that you don't hear about Ishwapuri actually giving him a name. He gets a new name. He actually gets the name uh, uh, Krishna Chaitanya uh, when he takes sannyas. So that's when he really becomes Lord Chaitanya. He's still technically Nimai Pandit, but um, they start calling him Gorahari at this point after he manifests his uh, when he starts doing the sankirtan then he becomes more known as gorahari among some of them but the, the most of the navadip vasis are still going to call him nimai because that's how they know him yeah okay anything else so what are we talking about on monday uh oh yeah on monday we're going to talk about lord chaitanya taking sannyas and going to Jagannath Puri. And we can talk a little bit about also about his um, uh, travels through South India and his insane Sankirtan pastimes there. It's really ecstatic. Okay, so thank you for attending. And I hope to see you all on Monday. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Hari Hari Evo. Oh.